before I turn over the mic to Tony Peterson, it is important to understand that futures, foreign currency, and options trading contain substantial risk and is not suitable for every investor. It is possible to lose all or more than one's initial investment. Risk capital is money that can be lost without jeopardizing one's financial security or lifestyle. Only risk capital should be used for trading, and only those with sufficient risk capital should consider trading. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. And also, please remember that these trading lessons are not solicitation or recommendation, but simply educational nature. Now, thank you again for joining us today. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Tony into the Ninja webinar room. And thanks, everybody, for coming. And I'm uh, happy to be here, happy to have uh, been invited to uh, present to you guys from Ninja Trader. Uh, it's really a good opportunity for all of us to kind of get to know each other and see what we're all about. There's a lot to, a lot of different ways to go about trading. And today we're going to talk about one that, uh, you know, maybe doesn't have the best reputation, but doesn't really have a good reason for it. You know, uh, when I got into day trading, it seemed like everywhere I went, everybody I talked to had the opinion that scalping was really sketchy and was for people who were like gamblers and like to shoot from the hip. And it was like the Wild West, right? So we're going to talk about scalping. Now, uh, first of all, uh, about me, most of you, I've been around uh, this for like 14 years. I've been doing this with Ninja Trader and the whole bit. So I've been around for a long time. If you've been in trading for any period of time, you probably at least heard of us or seen us or seen what we do. But in any event, uh, I started like many of you at, at day trading. I was a remodeling contractor for a little over 20 years. I worked really hard at that job and it was a, a pretty tough job if any of you are contractors. Um, and so I had decided after 20 years, I was kind of done with it and wanted to find something where I could generate the same income that it took me 20 years to work up to. But I felt like day trading might be that thing. So I kind of got bit by the day trading bug, just like the rest of you probably have. See it as an opportunity to change your life. So I thought it would take about six months. Ended up being about seven years before I managed to turn it around and become a professional trader. Something really big happened. And if you want to ask me about that, the we're having an event this Saturday. I'm going to show you. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But if you want to sign up for that event, you can do that. I'm going to put it in the chat. Uh, we're going to we're going to have an event. And I'll have a lot more time to answer questions. And so if you want to ask and talk about my past and how I made it through becoming a professional trader, I'll be happy to do that. All right. But that's this Saturday. Um, I've been a full-time trader since 2008, which turned me kind of into a trading educator because all my friends that I was day trading with that I met in trade rooms or on chat forums or whatever, they started asking me, well, hey, how come you don't suck so bad? I mean, I started teaching them what I had learned. And subsequently, so that I could make teaching them easier, I created a system uh, and, and indicators and things like that, which I had no prior knowledge of. So I just, I just plowed ahead and started working at it and hired some really good programmers and ended up uh, developing a a trading system that to this day, we're still trading. We don't change what's working. Okay. So in that system, of course, is technical indicators. And, and those are based on historical data, and historical ways that the market likes to act and react, which is what's very important to us is market reaction. Okay. I've got a quick question for you. In your experience in trading, has has scalping kind of been a bad word? Uh, I've never, I've never really considered myself a scalper. 
because there's a lot more to scalping than just taking small targets. So for me, when I got into day trading, scalping was not something that was highly thought of of somebody that was a professional trader. Okay. But after 14 years at this, uh, of just the teaching, I've been trading longer than that. You know, I think I'll just embrace it. I think I'll just embrace being a, a scalper, at least for the time being. And so for those of you that don't know what scalping is as it relates to day trading, it generally means taking profits from small changes. Okay. Now, some people want to enhance their day trading with, with scalping. I don't choose to do that. My entire trade plan is based around scalping. That's all I do. Typically, in the past, scalpers have been somebody who, who used large position sizes, trade a lot of lots, a lot of lots, to capitalize on these small changes in price. You know, a couple of ticks in and out. Most scalpers, that's minutes or seconds. We use really fast charts and really high performance technical indicators. Now, historically or traditionally, most people feel like, you know, scalpers are able to spend hours and hours focusing on technical indicators. We trade the most, in, we trade the most Sunday the most liquid uh, futures instruments, mostly the E-minis, gold and oil. Um, so we're going to be able to spend many hours focusing on technical indicators. We're going to have really good instincts about what the market is likely to do over the short term. Now, remember, this is traditionally accepted. A lot of people that don't understand scalping believe that scalpers have some sort of special powers. Okay, um, that that fundamental market analysis really doesn't matter. That the the scalpers will jump in and out of trades often dozens or hundreds of times per day. Not to say that they don't, but it's not required to be a scalper. See, that's where people get confused. That scalpers like fast trading and and excitement. You know, that they that they need that adrenaline rush. There's lots of high energy and that that scalpers are generally very impatient people and, and must have super flat, fast reflexes and can handle lots and lots of stress because jumping in and out of the markets a lot all day long. We're able to handle a lot of stress. Um, that we don't really care about a trend, that trend doesn't mean anything. Uh, and must know how to tape read and able to trade large position sizes. Now, each of these has something somewhat to do with what we do at the Intentional Trader, although it's not, you know, one thing or the other. We have found that scalping can be done without it having to be high energy, without it having to be high stress, without having to have special skills, all right? We do work hard, but we work hard at the right things. So one of the, the issues is people tend to wonder, and, and when they watch what we do and then they leave, it's because they believe that with such small targets and stops, how can you actually make any money? How can you make profits? How is that possible? So there, most people tend to think, you know, I want to trade the trend, I want to get in early, and I want to exit the trend right as it's ending. That's going to be the, most people believe, is uh, the way to day trade. Um, and that's what I was believing for the first seven years that I was struggling as a, as a day trader. Um, you know. Day trading can be profitable, and it can be profitable, particularly to those people that don't have large accounts. 
we don't recommend that you start day trading with and, and scalping with a large account size. You can do it without having to uh, trade a lot of money, right? So we trade several trades per session. Now, a session for us is 9 a.m. to noon Eastern time. We increase the lot size as our account, our trading account, and trade management skills grow. Okay? That's very important. You earn the ability to increase your lot size. That's, some, that's a kind of a different way of thinking about it. Small stop losses to manage risk per trade. Right? No fundamental analysis. We don't do that. We're all about technical indicators based on historical market reactions to specific events. We're about reduced exposure time in the markets because that reduces the stress, doesn't it? And we don't care about trends. Because a trend, I mean, is a trend, there's inside of every trend is another trend, right? So you can't really determine what is the overall trend. You might want to look at a long-term trend to help with your entries or whatever. We don't do that. We don't need to do that. Trades develop really quickly, but we have plenty of time to anticipate a trade setup to be ready for it. Now, we could be sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. And then suddenly a setup presents itself. All you have to do is be ready. It's kind of like sitting and waiting on a bus. We, we talk about waiting on a bus all the time. So when the bus shows up, you get up and you get on it. Trades are managed and exited quickly. Again, that reduces stress. That reduces mistakes. Small movements are easier to forecast than large ones. Right. So our our particular trading system allows for the trader to make adjustments based on their risk tolerance levels. When people come into the trading, they they tend to want to um, kind of follow what I'm doing. When they come into our room and, and, and trade along with us or try to trade our system, they kind of start using my plan as a starting point. And over time, they may either relax a few rules or tighten up on a few rules to kind of tune the system to their risk tolerance levels, which is unique kind of with our trading system. So this is my trade plan. Now, um, and many of our traders trade this plan exactly, and, and many will alter it a little bit. So I trade for a five-tick target per trade, hard target, in and out, because nobody ever went broke putting money in the bank, all right? Seven-tick stop loss, and oftentimes I can manage that stop loss to smaller than seven ticks. So I enter a trade with a bracket order. I have a five-tick target and a seven-tick stop. I never move my target and I never move my stop out, away, further out, because I believe something's going to happen. It's either seven ticks or less. On any given day, I trade for net three winning trades per session. Okay. Or net three losing trades per session. When I hit that net three, I continue trading in the session. Again, it's 9 a.m. to 12 noon. I continue trading uh, in that session until the end of the session in SIM. I do exactly the same thing. I keep trading exactly the same way. But most days, I put the money in the bank and I'm done for the day. And if you want to know more about that and why I do that, ask me on Saturday. On average, we're going to have about five trades per three-hour session. 
We may have one or two trades. We may have 15 trades. We take what the markets give us. Some days it gives a bunch, some days not that many. And that, you know, that's true with all trading systems. And again, 9 a.m. to 12 noon, that's Eastern time. My only job during those 9 a.m. to 12 noon, I have one job. I have only one job. Execute the trade plan. That's it. There's no thinking. There's no feeling. There's no analyzing. There's only reacting to the markets as it relates to my trade plan. You say, oh, I thought something was going to happen. You're not following the play trade plan, right? All of my afternoons, rather than sitting and waiting for a few more setups, the setups we get in the afternoons, you know, it's not quite as liquid in the afternoons. The setups we get are still good, but you just get fewer of them. And that's why we trade from 9 a.m. to noon. And then my time is much better spent practicing my trading using market replay so that instead of sitting for four hours and maybe taking a couple of trades, uh, I will sit for two hours and take 50 trades. Practicing, practicing, practicing. Because this is all about execution. We have a dramatic and tremendous edge. Now, our edge is really just like a bouncing ball. So it's very simple. Bouncing ball. Bouncing balls are pretty simple. You can, if you're watching a bouncing ball, you can pretty much anticipate what that ball is going to do especially in the very near future, but only if you have certain pieces of information, right? So you're looking at this ball and what's the ball made out of? It's, is it rubber or neoprene or plastic or metal or glass? I don't know. What's the density? Is it solid, filled with gravel, sand, styrofoam, water, uh, the air pressure? inside the ball or or do you drop it from four feet or three inches uh and how much energy did you put into a drop is it just a simple drop or is it shot from a cannon you know there's a lot a lot a lot of variables when it comes to bouncing ball but if you know those variables you can anticipate what's going to happen right now right and that's the same with what we do in trading it's like a bouncing ball. We get the ball dropping just like price is dropping. We measure everything that's coming into each bar. When we have a confluence of events, these events, these, uh, these market characteristics at that exact point in time, we can anticipate exactly what's going to happen. So as you can see, as the ball dropped, all of the characteristics necessary to figure out if the ball changed direction, when, by how much uh, uh, have been measured. And we're measuring it in every single tick that comes into each bar. Right? So we know if that ball was made of sand, what to expect as far as a, a, what type of a bounce to expect. If the floor is made out of rubber, we know what type of bounce to expect. Right. So if we know orders are coming into a bar in a certain way, we know what type of, of reaction to expect, what type of a potential bounce off of the floor, whatever that floor is. Okay. So we're taking measure volume, volatility, order flow. Um, we're looking at strength so that we can anticipate exhaustion. We do use support and resistance levels. And then on top of all of that, we're going to use a kicker, and that's divergence. So we want to know not just what's most likely to happen, but what's likely to happen right now. That's where our edge is. That's also what keeps us being a kind of relaxed, low-stress environment 
instead of what people typically think of when they think of scalping. Okay. And we've got it all down to a very simple process. And it's so simple. It's much more simple than any other trading style I tried when I was a struggling trader. And it's simple yes or no conditions. Our trades are based on a simple process. And it's something that had to be simple so that it can be easily repeatable and it can be practiced. Right. And then when you practice it over and over again, you become unconsciously competent at executing in real time. Okay. Uh, other trading systems I tried a long time ago were, were not procedural, you know, they were not linear. Uh, and, and thus that left me confused most of the time. You know, everything was about shades of gray. And all these shades of gray were killing me. I never knew for sure what I was supposed to do, all right? So our process goes like this. Does condition one exist? Condition one. And we'll talk about this a bit more on Saturday, on what each of these conditions are. I'm going to go over it a little bit here too, all right? So if condition one, the very first qualifying condition does not exist, we wait. We just wait. There's nothing else to do. If it does exist, we start looking for condition number two. Condition number two, does it exist? Nope. Guess what? We stop. We wait. If it does exist, we look for number three and so on. Right? This is linear decision making. Every answer is yes or no, not kind of, not well, some of them are, some of the conditions exist and some don't. So maybe I should get into this trade. Nope. It's either yes or no. And when finally you get to the end of the decision making process, you're going to execute the trade. This process. The entire process can be a couple of minutes. It could be a few seconds, which is why you've got to be really good at making these decisions. We have a tremendous edge, um, and we'll talk about that on Saturday. But there's a flip side to that, and that's execution. All right? Now, the problems that most of you have had, most the, and I certainly know this because I get a chance to talk to a lot of people, this problem that I had, and that is I never knew for sure if what I was doing was the right thing. I would enter a trade and then wonder, did I do the right thing? Is this the right setup? And I'd be, uh, I'd be confused and worried and stressed. And of course, I'm supposed to wait until something tells me to get out of that trade, which may be 30 minutes from now, an hour later in the day. I don't know, but I'm sweating bullets the whole time. Still don't know. But maybe I'm in a trade room and the moderator says, well, yeah, of course, because you can plainly see by all of this information on this blackboard that, of course, that qualifies as a trade setup. And I'm like, I don't understand any of that. I think maybe I understand the smiley face on the board, but other than that, I don't get it. I don't understand. This is beyond me. So I decided it had to be easier than that. So what I decided to do is simplify everything. And I, okay, I told you I was a, a contractor. So I decided you know, I'm a failing trader. Everything I've tried, everything that everybody's told me has not worked. It just doesn't work. I can't get it to work because I'm broken. So I decided to, to approach trading differently. I decided that I have a particular skill as a contractor. That skill is problem solving. And that's one of the things that I was not applying to day trading. 
I was trying to problem solve and that was, oh, I'm losing. I want to win more. How do I do that? And I would throw a bunch of indicators. I'd read a bunch of books. I'd watch videos. I'd do all those things that most traders do. Nothing worked. But instead, I thought, you know, I'm going to study this and I'm going to try to solve it as a problem. So here's I'm going to show you what I came up with. We're going to talk more about on Saturday that problem solving and everything that I did to get through that. Um, and the logic behind how we ended up where we are now. So I'm going to show you the indicators we use so you understand better. And then I'm going to show you trades. Okay. So for those of you that are very impatient and don't really care about um, this other information, all you want to know is when to push the button, when to push the button, when to push the button. I'll show you that. Okay. Um, all right. Mom meter indicator. Okay. So as I mentioned, we measure strength to anticipate, anticipate upcoming weakness. Every time you see a strong move, in the market, there are three things that are going to happen. Either people start getting stopped out, people start um, bailing out because price is going against them and they freak out, or they start taking profits. All three of those things cause price to stop and change directions, at least for the short term. Okay. So we want to measure strength so that we can anticipate weakness, right? So we're doing that here. We've got a hard drop here where price was in a channel, right? Price is in a channel, but then we have a hard sudden drop. That strength these, these bars turn color so that we can see when they're getting uh, potentially exhausted. The lighter the color, the, the higher the probability of a pullback, the more imminent the pullback is going to be. So something happened inside this bar that caused price to take off this way. We're going we're gonna to talk about that and that we're going to explore what's going on inside this bar so we know when this is going to turn, okay? So then we have our FT reset indicator. That's our support and resistance line. So we get, that's probably our second or third most, most popular indicator that people buy off our websites because our lines work really, really well, but they don't really do anything special that, you can't get other places. It's floor trader pivots. We use mid pivots, but we also have um, a uh, relative strength indication at the end of each line. And if price approaches this line at, in a kind of a straight up fashion quickly, you're more likely to get a reaction to that line if you have a higher number here, okay, or no number. If we get a trade setup with major resistance behind our trade, we know that the chances are the trade's going to go in our favor because even if it keeps testing that line, if it reacted to the line here, there's a good chance it's going to test and react here and then down it goes. All right. So that's our support and resistance lines. Our overbought and oversold indicator. Overbought, oversold. Now, most of us know overbought or oversold because we're going to have a histogram at the bottom of a chart with wavy lines on it, right? And it's going to take up part of the chart. And if this histogram uh, touch a, touches or exceeds one of these um, outer lines, then we know we're in an overbought or an oversold condition. Now, <clears throat> my theory is I'm going to be able to make better and faster decisions if I put it right on the bar I'm looking at to make a decision. You'll notice the outline of these bars. These bars here are blue and these are pink. These are pink. That says they're overbought and oversold. I don't have to look anywhere else. I don't have to look at a wavy line. I don't have to discern if the 
well, is that touching the line? Is it over the line? Is it short of the line? Is it actually overbought? Was it overbought for a little while? And then it became uh, uh, that it wasn't. And no, nothing like that. All of our decisions are based on yes or no. Yes or no. Overbought, not overbought. And that's it. All right. So we're, when we start getting overbought or oversold, that's when we can anticipate that the exhaustion is likely to set in. Okay. Our speed tick indicator, what we're reading with the speed tick indicator is orders that are being processed through the exchange and at the rate at which the orders are being processed, it's highly unlikely that us little retail traders, you and me, that don't have these giant accounts are able to move price that fast. That means it's the big money that are doing it. The big money is most likely manipulating these particular bars because they're a they have the money and they have the uh, uh, the the technology to move the markets when they want so that they can manipulate the markets. They can manipulate you and I, and they can cause a reaction. So. Our mission is to identify when that's happening and then to anticipate the reaction of all the retail traders that are trading at that point in time. Okay. Pullback alert indicator that, you know, I got people say, Hey, Tony, how come you don't use volume? I do. And we call it the pullback alert. And there's, even though this was, looks like such a, an insignificant little thing on your chart, there is an awful lot of data going into this. We're reading every tick of every bar. And when we get a particular type of volume coming into a bar that suggests that the buyers were well in charge, and then up here, the buyers and sellers kind of got in a fight and they start. Uh, uh, this churning action. Well, we know the buyers are most likely getting exhausted and the sellers have just been kind of sitting up here waiting. So they're not exhausted. So chances are strong that the sellers will take control and price is going to change directions. Okay. So that's our pullback alert indicator. Ricochet. So you remember the speed tick. Well, this was kind of a byproduct of the speed tick. And the speed tick reads the speeds of the order being processed. The ricochet reads the acceleration of the orders being processed. The ricochet may not read the top speed, like let's say the top speed for generating a speed tick is 100 miles an hour. The ricochet may only get to up to 80 miles an hour, but if it accelerated from almost nothing to 80 miles an hour, then we know there's likely something is going to happen. And that was a byproduct of doing a study on the speed tick. I created a histogram so I could see when the speed tick was likely, but I also noticed something else was happening, and that was the sudden acceleration. In orders uh, that was also unlikely that us retail traders were able to do it. So you think of the speed tick more like a Formula One car, and you think of the uh, ricochet as more like a drag race. Super D. All right. This is, this is what kind of started changing things for us, or at least very least uh, divergence. We were doing really well. And then I started, uh, you know, I had used divergence earlier in my career and I was, I just struggled with it. It was so hard. I tried all kinds of different indicators. I tried all kinds of stuff. I could not get divergence to work, even though I heard it was supposed to be really good. So instead of, again, I took it as a problem I needed to solve. And instead of it being something where I looked externally for the answers, I instead told my programmer, I, you know, here's my thinking on how we're going to create an algorithm for 
divergence. And he took what I told him and he developed an indicator. And the very first time I put it on a chart, it was like, oh, holy crap. This is awesome. All right. This is awesome. The Super D has picked up where price and momentum have changed directions. For those of you that don't know divergence, that's when when price say price is moving up and momentum. So this in this particular example here, you see price moving this way, right? But momentum has changed directions. Momentum has already changed directions. Price is going to do everything it can to try to follow momentum. Okay. That's the divergence. That's this right here. Now we have seven different divergence oscillators inside the Super D. If you see a 3D on the chart, that just means that three of the divergence oscillators are, are saying that there is divergence. Okay. And so we use that in a couple of different ways. And of course, the coup de gras, one that everybody wants, one that for those of you that uh, have been asking and wondering, I talked to Jeremy again over at um, uh, over at Shark Indicators, Bloodhound. He's working diligently on fixing uh, up their uh, stuff so that it can uh, process the rock star uh, and be used inside of Bloodhound. This is a confluence of signals that we already have on the charts. But we can tune those signals inside the rock star to generate a signal on the chart. Okay. These are our triggers. This is a trigger to enter a trade. Okay. Not every trade, not every trade. It's a trigger to enter trades that qualify based on the trade plan. Okay. If you take every rock star trade, you're going to get beat to death. But the rules are simple. All right. Now, this does print on the open. The first tick that comes in is when this prints. You don't have to wait. Your decision is made when this bar opens. And I'm going to show you that on some videos uh, that I have coming up. Okay. So when you add all of these together, we have a confluence of events that are happening right now, right now, not later. We're not making decisions on things that are happening now and hoping that 10, 20, 30 minutes, an hour from now, those conditions are going to still exist. You realize that we're in a different world now. Market conditions change dramatically quickly all the time so the decisions you make for an hour from now how many influences do you think are affecting the markets during that hour a lot an awful lot so things change all the time which is why i want to make decisions like a bouncing ball i have the information that i have for right now when that ball hits the floor, I know exactly what it's going to do based on the information that I have right now. Okay. That's why we use confluence of indicators. So think of it this way. You've got one guy and you ask him a question and you need some good advice, right? And he goes, yep, I agree with that, with what you're thinking. And you go, okay. <clears throat> so he agrees. So it must be a good idea. Or what if we got him and a whole bunch of other people that agree? And these people come from a non-correlated group, meaning they don't know each other. They're all from different backgrounds, different life experiences. And they all come together from these different experiences and different education levels and, and different angles that they're approaching the problem, they're all coming to the same conclusion. So what's more credible, one guy 
or a whole group of people that share the same opinion. And that's how we approach the confluence. We're looking for an agreement that, yes, we have a strong push where, where we have some momentum. We agree we, we have an overbought condition. We have a market manipulation. We have um, uh, volume suggesting that the buyers were in control and now the sellers are going to potentially come in and uh, take over from the exhausted buyers. Then we have divergence set in on top of all of that and price drops. Okay. So again, I want to, I want to reemphasize how straightforward and easy this is to learn and to execute. All you have to do is learn the setups and then execute the steps. So the first step is we have a channel, right? We have this channel price is trading in a channel. What are we doing when price is in a channel? We're doing nothing. We're sitting and waiting. Now, if, uh, and, and then once it breaks out of a channel, we'll say, yep, it broke out of a channel. Now we're going to start looking for the next step. Is there a strong move? Are those bars breaking out of the channel quickly? And is it, uh, are, are they bars much bigger than the previous bars? So if we have a strong move, great. If we don't, what do we do? We just wait. So do we have a strong potential for exhaustion? We're reading the indicators. If we don't, we just wait and we don't do anything. But if we do, then we look for the next thing. Do we have, do we see manipulation? Are the market makers interested in manipulating this bar? No, they're not. Let's wait. Yes, they are. Are we slamming into areas of support and resistance? If no, does it qualify for one of our other trade setups? If it doesn't, then we wait. If it does, we go, okay, is there a rock star? Yes. Then we trade it. Execute the trade. The trade is executed at the open, or at least the decision is made at the open of the bar with the rock star on it. We'll talk more on Saturday about how to enter this trade. And you can actually get into this trade better than that open price. All right. So very simple, very straightforward, something I never had the opportunity to learn when I was struggling and looking everywhere for a system that made sense to me. You know, I know market conditions can change quickly, particularly in this day and age. But nobody was addressing that. All right. But let's see what it looks like. Okay. This is a this is just a little video. Uh, because I, I'm a firm believer in watching live charts. If you look at static charts, what is what do you learn from a static chart? What do you what do you know about this? But can you see my point? Uh oh. Ah, uh, nuts. Where'd go? Hold on just a second. Where did that go? There it is. Um, so any bar on this chart, you only have four pieces of information. Four pieces. High, low, open, close for each bar. That's all you know. Unless there's some indicator on it that tells you something else. But on a typical trading chart, you know, high, low, open, close, which is why looking at static charts, trying to figure out how to trade, trying to learn how to trade from somebody who's teaching it, scrolling backwards on static charts is nearly impossible. I didn't know it at the time. This is one of those things I learned after so many years of struggling as a trader and then becoming a professional trader. I realized in hindsight, you know, all those things they were telling me. You can't do it like trade without emotion. You can't do it. So there's a lot of stuff out there that isn't true, but it just keeps getting regurgitated. So we believe it to be true, just like believing, you know, it's one of these uh, faulty assumptions or expectations that people have about the, like the, like the flat, like the world is 
flat, right? That was the conventional wisdom of the day. All right. So I've got a, let me start from the beginning. So I'm, I have a little slider here, so I'm just going to drag it. So it's a little bit quick, uh, a little bit quicker and easier to see. All right. So this bar has dropped. We have a bunch of indicators on it. Now, the key to this is the open of that bar. The open is where we will make our, the open of this bar is where the decision is made to enter the trade. But price actually backed up a little bit, didn't it? You could get a better fill here. So instead of getting to putting on a buy order, you're putting on a buy order here. So instead of putting it on here, you try to get it in here. Okay. And then typically we may get some acts and then that's it. That's all we need. I'm done. I'm out of that trade. I don't feel compelled to worry about what happens later. I'm not anticipating a reversal. I want five ticks, hard target. I hit my target. I put the money in the bank. I sit back. I relax and wait for the next. Once again, notice when the indicators print. Just became overbought. We're hitting our line of resistance. Now, this is what's called a speed tick trade setup. It did not need a rock star. And down it went. All right, same thing. This is a naked rock star trade setup, naked because it doesn't have support behind it. I'm actually going to show you some other trades, not only all winners. I'll show you some losers and I'll show you some trades that look like trades, but they're actually not. I want to show you when the indicators actually start printing. Some of these videos jump ahead. But you see the confluence of events. Look at the amount of confluence of indicators up here. And you don't have to know what each one means at this point. What you need to know is that we've got all kinds of, we're reading every tick coming into these bars that tells us something is about to change. Okay. We have, we have all that confluence. All right. So watch this bar. I think this is a good one. Nope. This bar. Okay. So notice it's nothing. There's, there's no indicators on it. Now, see where the speed tick printed? So the orders being processed through the exchange suddenly hit a, a speed or a level where it's highly unlikely that us retail traders did that. And as soon as that level gets hit, we're going to print a speed tick. We also... Got a pullback alert that suggests that inside this bar is a churning activity. The buyers and sellers are fighting, right? And we had sudden acceleration, at, but we did not have a trade setup. Doesn't mean it's not going to drop. It only means we did not have a trigger to enter that trade. Okay. Again, same thing. No trigger to enter the trade. We had the, the rock star. We did not have what we needed on this bar according to our rules. All right. So we got a strong push up. We have a speed tick. We have an overbought condition, but we did not have a, tr a trigger to enter this trade. All right. This qualified. Notice price dropping. The millimeter turns black, speed tick, slam into support, pullback alert, ricochet. And these are just I'm probably taken from last week or the week before, just whenever I made these, this video. This isn't like a long time ago. But here's the funny thing. It could also be 10 years ago because we're doing the same thing we were doing 10 years ago. It hasn't changed. There's nothing new. Once you learn it, there will never be anything new to learn. This is it. All you have to do is practice this and master it. Notice the price opening. We did take some heat, 
But here's a here's one of the things I was talking about earlier. Let me back this up. Notice the bar open and immediately dropped. So instead of shorting it here, if and chances are you wouldn't have been able to because it opened and dropped. I mean, not shorting it. Instead of buying it here, you could buy it down here. So you got a better fill because we know this is what I call freight training. You know, this is like a big freight train and it's trying to slow down and change directions, but it's going to, you know, it's still got some speed to it and then it'll finally turn around. You do get a lot of that. So you can actually get better than open fills. And there's the there's the winner right there. All right. Now I'll show you more of these on Saturday. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But you notice it's the same thing over and over and over again. I make the decision on the open of the bar. If I can buy it at a better price, you're darn right I'm going to buy it at a better price. And we do that all the time. We're going to offer you a 20% discount on our programs. We have three different programs. We have our starter program, extra income program, and our pro trader program. All of those you can find on our website. Yes, Saturday will be recorded. As long as you uh, register, you'll get a uh, you'll get a copy of the recording. The Pro Trader program is by far the most popular because it's the biggest bang for the buck. Basically, anything we've ever developed or anything we develop in the future, you get it for free. All right. Well, I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank Ninja Trader for sponsoring this. I hope for sure to see all of you on Saturday. We can go into a lot more detail. The events on Saturday. Uh, oh, the coupon code. Yeah, the discount code is right here on the. Uh, it's right here. There's the coupon code. Sorry, I thought you guys saw that. Pro Trader Program. Uh, look on our website. Uh, if you go to that link I put in. You'll get more information about it. If you need more information or you want to talk about it, send us an email at support at the intentional trader.com. And, and uh, if you have any questions, and you can certainly reach us from our contact page on our website. All right. Thanks again, everybody, for coming. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you all on Saturday. Thomas, take it away.